Welcome to The Art of Charm. I'm your host, Jordan Harbinger, and I'm here with producer Jason DeFilippo. Here at The Art of Charm, we may not have all the answers, but we certainly have some of the questions, and today on Fan Mail Friday, those questions come from you. And then we'll do our best to give you some answers, some advice, some uh, admonishment, tough love, horseplay, what have you. I just got back from Australia a couple, well, a few days ago, and uh, Jason, this I meant to tell you this before, I'm on the plane from Australia. It, this is actually a domestic flight, not the one that you know, I had coming back. And the captain comes on. This is so Australian somehow. He comes on and goes, good morning. Well, I'm sorry to report that even though we've been delayed getting off the tarmac and now we are close to Melbourne, things just aren't going all that well. Turns out that even though we spent all that extra time on the ground, we're really no closer to getting in on time. We'll be touching down in nine minutes past the hour, and in six minutes' time, we'll be going into a racetrack holding pattern just to waste a bit of time. Then, if we're lucky, they'll let us land. Cheers. I thought that was so <laughs> ridiculous. That's insane. Yeah, like, here's the brutal truth and why I hate my job. Here's a bunch of, I mean, or it's just, I don't know. It's so Australian somehow to be that blunt. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, it's so funny how they talk over there sometimes. They just, they'll, hey, what do you think of this? Mm, yeah, I don't like it that much. Whoa, okay, not used to that, especially coming from, like, the Midwest and California. Everyone's like, oh, it's so nice, oh, it's so great. They're, they're like, mm, it's kind of ugly, why'd you buy that? Yeah, I'm wondering if they ever use the uh, the question, does this make my ass look fat over there? Because they probably go, yeah, it does, actually. Yeah, yeah. terrible. <laughs> Shouldn't have, yeah, what were you thinking? That kind of thing. Yeah, I don't know. I, lo- I love that about them, though. I will give them that. All right, Jason, let's cut to it. Good evening, AOC staff. Well, good evening back to you. Yes, and to you, sir. I've been listening to the podcast for over a year now with great improvement. I absolutely love what you're all doing. However, one episode that I have yet to encounter is de-escalation techniques for those agitated customers or irritated patients, and I work in healthcare. I was wondering if you could make a podcast introducing conflict de-escalation techniques for those individuals who are angry or otherwise. Regards, Stuck on the Escalator. Nice. All right. So I've mentioned some of this stuff with the kidnap story, which I will not retell here because I've told it so many, so many times that I feel like, Jason, am I banned from I'm banned from that story, right? You are never allowed to talk about the kidnapping ever again. Okay. It's banned. Uh, I feel like I get an annual one, but maybe not. Anyway, when I had the kidnapping thing happen the second time, the one that I had to talk my way out of, I had to stay logical, so I recommend you do that. And what that means is there's a logical versus emotional frame of a conversation. So if someone's like, screw you, this place sucks, and you reply with, screw you, you suck, just don't come back if you hate it so much, you know, F you, that kind of thing, that is emotional conversation, goes without saying. There's other types of emotional conversation, passive-aggressive, that kind of thing that's not logical. If you stay logical where you just talk about facts, data, so for example, when I was doing dealing with the kidnap situation, they were like, you know, you bombed our country, you son of a bitch, I hate all Americans, you're just like everyone else, you're a freaking spy, I would say something like, where do you recommend that I go out to eat? And it doesn't have to be a non sequitur like that, it could be something like, actually, I'm not a spy, I work at this language school. And, you know, you, you explain to them, it's on this place, it's near these places, my boss's name is this, you can ask her, these are all questions. You don't say, I work at this language school, and then it's here and here and here, and you should just call my boss, just call my boss, uh, don't beat me up, right? You have to say something like, very calm, stay logical, stay data-driven, and that will help people de-escalate, because they have to then put all of the work into being emotional, And it's really tiring if one person is calm and you're the emotional one. It's really hard to stay emotional over a prolonged period of time if nobody's feeding energy back to you in in that particular type of conversation. So stay logical. That will de-escalate things pretty quickly. And then there's along those same lines out frame what's going on here so if they're in this emotional crazy mode where they're just like i hate coming here you guys always suck you're always idiots a store sucks you can out frame this by staying in that logical mode but also staying in problem solving friendly mode so you literally ignore the emotional context of the interaction so you can first of all you acknowledge it at first like yeah you know what it does make sense that you're this upset about this, I understand completely. And then ignore the emotional context. If they stay mad, they stay annoyed, ignore all of that emotional stuff. And, you know, I hate coming here. You guys are all idiots. Your support's a bunch of idiots. 
oh, I totally understand the frustration with this, sir. Let's fix this. I want to get this fixed for you right now. So, okay, first of all, what have you tried? You tried turning it on? Did you try replacing the batteries? Would you like me to show you how to do that? And they say, no, you idiot. Of course I know how to replace batteries. Come on. You think I'm some kind of moron? No, of course not. Okay, so we're going to check the batteries just to make sure they aren't dead because batteries do tend to go dead. And then I'm going to run a couple of tests on this thing, right? So you just keep returning to that problem-solving friendly mode, staying logical so that their emotional energy goes to waste and they will eventually calm down. This is kind of like Aikido. So you say, wow, that really is frustrating. Let's get this fixed. So you accept it and then you sort of redirect it. And it takes them from a conflict mindset to the I'm on your team mindset. And this will work 99% of the time. And I know it sounds a little obvious, but I think that it's beyond that. I think staying logical and out framing are not necessarily the most advanced techniques, but you will start to come up with advanced techniques once you start to work this a lot. Uh, The tricky part is not in knowing what to do here. The tricky part is in remaining unemotional and keeping your frame when really what you want to do is say, look, jackass, you're the dumbass who's installed, you know, clicked on a virus, or you're the dumbass who dropped it uh, in a pool of water. So I'm not here to make your life easier. Stop treating me like crap. That's what you really want to do, but you cannot do that if you want to de-escalate. But this stuff will work 99% of the time. The other 1% where it doesn't work, these are people who can't help but act this way because it's how they are with everyone. So they have unlimited, seemingly, emotional energy to have temper tantrums, be ridiculous. It has nothing to do with you. That's important to remember is their emotional crap that's going on has absolutely nothing to do with you. So do what I just mentioned. If it doesn't work, don't worry about it. Just do your job and make sure you don't end up spending more time with these types of people than you have to. I totally feel like you've used this on me quite <laughs> quite a Definitely. few times. Of course. I'm a, I'm a bit of a hothead, they say. I use this with everyone. And it's sub, it's a, it's actually subconscious at this point. And I use it with my wife and she uses it with me and I use it all the time. All the time. Because it's really more effective than I'm going to get emotional and whipped up about something. It's different. I don't it's not that I don't get whipped up. I just decide I'm going to spend the next 5 minutes venting about this. But or, you know, five hours, whatever. If I don't want to deal with that and someone's coming to me with this, this big problem, you know, there's people who've worked here in the past, maybe currently, that do that stuff all the time. Uh, you know who they are. And I don't want to sit there and deal with emotional temper tantrums for five hours when I'm in the car or when I'm at dinner with my family. Tell me the urgent thing. Let's get it fixed. And we'll move on. And a lot of times, if people just want to vent about something and you're staying in that logical problem solving mode, they'll get bored real fast because they want you to go, that's ridiculous. I can't believe that. Let's fire that son of a bitch right now. If you just stay calm and you go, oh, okay, well, I'm going to reevaluate some of his work then. Okay, well, I'm going to schedule that for next week. None of this sounds super urgent and I'll take care of it. Then they're like, "Eh, you're not going to you're not playing ball with me here. You're not venting with me, so I'm done. I'm going to go call my girlfriend, which is what they should have done in the first place. That's fantastic. All right. Next up. Hey, Jordan. Happy Friday. What's the best way to re-enter your alumni network? A little background first. I graduated from a very, very prestigious school under less than ideal circumstances about six years ago. There was a lot of drama, bad grades, skipped classes, failed expectations, and worried professors and administrators. No criminal or legal issues, though, thankfully. I fell out of touch with pretty much all of my classmates because of personal issues that made me feel like I couldn't reach out to them. I'm at a point where I'm no longer a giant hot mess and I'm actively building my relationships and network. What's the most respectful and mutually beneficial approach to leveraging my alumni network? Thanks. Signed, went through a phase. Yeah, so this is a very non-unique situation. I think with the alumni network, you don't hear about that all the time, but you hear a lot about people who've reinvented themselves from disasters and are trying to recover their social networks. So this is like any mistake that you make. If this is the elephant in the room, just own it. And if you decide to make contact with people in your alumni network, which I think you you could and should, definitely reach out to people you think you had a better connection with and just own it. Explain what happened. Look, I was a giant mess back then. I was insecure about this. I was trying to make this thing happen. It didn't happen. And I was kind of, you know, angry at the world, whatever is going on there. Own it and explain what happened and then let it go because people probably know that or they didn't notice and didn't care. So I thought, for example, oh man, you know, it's kind of a 
douchebag in college and I should, you know, go back and any of these relationships I value, I should be wary of that when I interact with these people. And I remember running into somebody on the subway in New York and he was like, oh, hey, man, what's going on? And I was like, hey, you know, back in college, I remember being kind of a mess. And he's like, really? I don't remember that at all. Um, I just remember being kind of like quiet. And I was like, really? You don't remember me being kind of like abrasive and insecure? And he's like, no, not really. And I'm like, oh, OK, cool. And he's like, well, congratulations for getting through that in, a, in any case. And <laughs> congratulations on the business you built. And I thought, wow, you know, I was so self-conscious. But what you will realize when you talk to a lot of these people, none of them notice, man. And none of them care, really. The people that do really think, wow, that guy was the screw up of our class, you know. Oh, my goodness. If you own it and you explain what happened, half of them are going to be like, oh, okay, great. I didn't even notice. And the other 48% are going to go, oh, yeah, you were kind of a mess. I do remember you being kind of crazy. They're not going to care. I I really think that you're more self-conscious about this than anything. Now, in addition to that, let's assume that you are right. And everyone's like, oh, my God, you're the craziest screw up. Everyone hated you. What a terror. I can't even believe I answered the phone. It doesn't matter. What your conduct says about you from here is really important. So keep your word. If you meet up with someone, don't cancel. Show up on time. Act right. Basically, be the mature version of yourself, and that's going to start to override those first impressions. Now, the problem is it takes a long time and a lot of repetition to overwrite negative first impressions. That said, if your last impression was 10 years ago because you had a this crazy drama back then and you've been separated for uh, six years ago, right? It looks like six years. That's a long-ass time, right? A lot of these people are not going to remember anything. So if you act right and you keep your word, that's going to be their new impression of you, and I would lastly ask, why do you need to re-enter your alumni network? It's often easier to start fresh. I'm all about repairing a bridge wherever possible, but I'm wondering if, sure, you graduated from a very, very prestigious school. Let's say you graduated from Harvard, and uh, you know there's a lot of drama, bad grades, skip classes. I still wonder, how much do those people in that class really matter? A lot of them might have great positioning, but there's a lot of people that you don't have to start from negative 10 with that will also have good positioning. And I'm all about repairing these bridges, but how much is this worth to you? You know, I would start doing it anyway, but I would be very cautious of saying, I need these bridges to be repaired in the next 90 days so I can get a job. That's going to be problematic because you're going to come at it with an agenda, which is bad. People are going to smell that and go, oh, you're being nice because you want something. Same old, same old went through a phase, same old L that we knew from back then. That's going to be a problem for you. So dig the well before you're thirsty and start the repair process now. Don't expect anything from these people till 2019. This episode of Fan Mail Friday is sponsored by Allbirds. Allbirds is on a mission to prove that comfort, good design, and sustainability don't have to be mutually exclusive. These are shoes. They got a funny name. Allbirds is a weird name for shoes. I'm just going to throw that out there. But these are so comfortable. They're like sweatpants for your feet. And they're just made from this awesome New Zealand merino wool that uses fibers that are 20% the diameter of a human hair. So unlike the wool you might be used to, they're not scratchy, they breathe, there's no itch, there's no sweaty feet going on. And Jason, you got a pair of these as well. I love my Allbirds shoes. I got the wool runners, and I think they're the same ones you got. They're lace-up. Yeah, yeah. A, they look really good. I wore them to Thanksgiving, and everybody commented. They're like, those are some swanky-looking shoes. What Mm -hmm. you got there? I'm like... They're my wool Allbirds shoes. Nice. But the great thing about it is I can wear them around the house without any socks. And they're super comfortable. And then I can, you know, go out. I got to throw socks to go outside because it's cold. But uh, they're, uh, they are great for just all day, everyday wear. I cannot believe how cool these wool shoes are. Yeah, I was a little bit. Whenever people send us shoes, half the time we deny we deny the sponsor because yeah. we're like, uh, no, these fashion clogs, you know, made in some gross Chinese factory by small children are not stylish, and I feel gross just wearing them, and they smell weird. But these are really rad. They don't have a bunch of logos and detailing. They've got a simple design. they got that sort of 
simple minimalist design, so I dig those. And they've got this 30-day wear in the wild trial period, so you can wear them for a month, see if you like them. Free returns, free shipping, free as a bird. And even their packing is tree hugger. It uses 40% less materials than traditional shoe packaging, so that's kind of that's the vibe they're going for. So find your perfect pair. Visit allbirds.com, like allbirds.com, and remember that 30-day trial period, and if for some reason you're not satisfied, you can return your shoes with no questions asked, even if you've worn them out in the wild like a, or without socks like Jason, which is just gross. I'm going to throw that out there. That's allbirds.com. If you've been listening to the podcast for a minute, you know how serious I am about helping you make significant, lasting changes in your life. The truth is we explore a lot of cool ideas here on the show, but the listeners who undergo real transformations, they all went through our live residential program here at AOC. Now, I'm willing to bet that you've heard me talk about our boot camps and thought, yeah, you know, that sounds cool and I might be ready for that kind of experience, but, you know, that's something other people do. It's not really for me, but I want to tell you this. It is for you. Our boot camps are designed for people just like you, people who want to learn how to apply the principles on the show to create meaningful change in their lives, because here's the truth. You can listen to my voice every single week for years and still be stuck in the same routines, the same habits, the same life. You can be the person who thinks about getting better, or you can be the person who decides that today is the day you're going to commit to being excellent. So join me and thousands of people who've taken action in their lives and learn more about our AOC boot camps at the Art of Charm. Dot com or just email me, jordan at theartofcharm.com. And if you're in the military or your intelligence agency affiliated, check out elitehumandynamics.com for more information on programs we have that are designated especially for you. That's at elitehumandynamics.com. All right, moving on. Jordan, something's been on my mind a lot lately, and you might have some insight. I've had a lot of unique experiences in my life, from meeting cool and not cool people in bizarre ways to traveling the country selling magazines door-to-door for a few years, and also traveling to schools all over to teach kids about animals. I saw so many wonderful places and met a ton of interesting and crazy people all over the U.S. My list of seemingly out-of-the-ordinary jobs and experiences goes on. Now I'm becoming certified to be a body language trainer and plan to start a business. I'm passionate and excited about everything I've done and am doing. Those things should make me feel like a badass, but they make me feel unrelatable. I get really weird when talking to people about my experiences because I feel like they think I'm lying or exaggerating or showing off. When I start to tell a story or relate to someone about a place they went or experience they had, I fumble and rush my words. I get really anxious and I probably look like I'm lying, which makes the feeling even worse. I want to talk about my experiences because they excite me and people generally like to see others show passion and excitement. I know I do. Is this some off brand of imposter syndrome? In my mind, I tell myself to slow down, be confident in what you're saying, or who the heck gives a crap if they think you're lying. But I still have a lot of anxiety with this. Any suggestions to what this might be about or advice on how to overcome it? Thanks, AOC, and keep kicking ass at what you do. Anxious, but interesting. Hey, this is classic, from the sound of it, classic imposter syndrome, and one of the many, many incarnations thereof. This is you not wanting to come across as a show-off, so you try to minimize your imprint and your image, and since you're trying to edit yourself and audit your behavior in the moment, in real time, it comes across as inauthentic because it's inauthentic. So that shows up as nervousness in your nonverbal communication, which makes you more self-conscious, and since you're, again, trying to edit your behavior in the moment, you notice that, which makes you even more anxious, and you've got this downward spiral, this negative vicious cycle that's causing you to feel awful about all your interactions. This is only going to get worse before it gets better, unfortunately. However, there is some good hope for you on this. It's a longer subject, and we've talked about this a lot. Actually, we just released an episode in the AOC Toolbox on imposter syndrome. There's a couple in there, actually, and we can link to those in the show notes. But if you go back to recent AOC Toolbox episodes, and if you're on the website, theartofcharm.com slash toolbox, that's where those are. But also, if you just look recently in the feed and look for the Toolbox episode on imposter syndrome, this will also help explain a lot about what's going on there and some strategies on how to fix it. And it's a longer subject. So if you're dealing with anything like this and you're listening to this, definitely go back and check out the Toolbox episode on imposter syndrome because this is very, very common. You'll be relieved to know that this is a common trait of high performers. 
it's actually more common in high performers than it is in low performers. So it's a good indicator that you are self-aware and that you realize that you've come a long way. So most people who are, you've got that Dunning-Kruger thing. If you're really, really low on the totem pole, you're like, ah, I'm great at this. I'm going to be awesome at this. You don't think for a second that maybe there's something, some hitch going on here. But if you're self-aware, you're a high performer, generally you're going to feel some level of imposter syndrome for a long time. And so you can consider that a good sign. But it also still go, it's going to still affect you negatively. So get to that toolbox episode, get some of those strategies out of the toolbox and start implementing those right away. All right, Jason, next up. Hey, AOC. I work with special ed students, and I actually use a lot of the stuff you guys teach with my students since social skills are so important for them to develop. How do I suggest the podcast to people that I think could really benefit from it? I always broach the subject with the subtext that I listen to it, and it's really helped me. And so in my mind, that would mean that there's this collective attempt at improvement rather than me sitting on some pedestal looking down on them. However, the few times that I've done this, I have received a response akin to them being hurt that I would even suggest it. Could it be the way that I'm doing it is wrong, or is it just that the person is unwilling to admit that they can improve? In my mind, literally everyone can improve, so my suggestion is not rooted in some notion of their flawed existence, but instead in a caring way. Perhaps I'm having a hard time conveying this. How would you go about this? Signed, Don't Kill the Messenger. So I'm a little unclear by the email whether or not you are recommending the show to your special ed students or to random other people. I would say if you're recommending it to the special ed students, they're used to being second-guessed and to second-guessing themselves. If you're recommending it to other people like your friends, colleagues, and they're still having this sort of reaction to it, then yeah, classic ego problem. They're insulted that you'd assume that they aren't perfect. It's like they're the only ones not in on the joke at that point. And this isn't specific to your friends or your students, but for young and old alike, whenever we suggest people can learn something, especially something with a a name that might be controversial, like, oh, the art of charm, I don't need that, I'm already charming, screw you. I, I hear stuff like that not necessarily that direct, but I hear stuff like that all the time. It's part of the reason I want to rename the show in the first place. But whenever we suggest that people can learn something, only a small percentage of people will actually be interested in that at all. And the rest of the people that you talk to in any field, in any niche, social skills aside, will want to remain in the fiction and maintain the fiction that they're coming across flawlessly and there's no work to be done in this area. And social skills are an especially tender one because it's something that we know we're probably, we probably could use some work on, especially if you're recommending it to these folks. They're probably thinking like, oh man, you know, everyone thinks I'm cool, I hope so. And you're like, hey, there's this show called The Art of Charm and they're like, screw you, you're seeing through my facade, Right. It's like if you're talking with somebody who views themselves as a newbie salesman and you give them sales resources, a sales podcast, a good one is the brutal truth about sales and selling uh, with a friend of mine who runs that. They, they, a newbie salesperson would be like, oh, great, thanks. But somebody who's been selling for 10 years and thinks that they're awesome and doesn't have any room to grow which is not necessarily a good salesman, but somebody who's got an ego built up around the identity of being a good salesman, that person might be like, I don't need this. What is this? Some joker's going to tell me how to be a good salesman? I've been here for 10 years. Thanks, though, buddy. They're going to get insulted by that because their ego is protecting them and they're protecting their ego. That's a big problem. So I would not worry about it. It's, It's part and parcel of recommending any kind of learning resource to anyone. If you come to a newbie skater and you say, here's a Tony Hawk tape on how to do amazing tricks for newbies, they'll probably be really stoked. But if you talk to somebody who views themselves as an awesome skater because they've been doing it for 90 days straight, they might throw it back in your face. It just has to do with how they handle their learning curve. And a lot of people, and a lot of people have to go through in a zone where the ego is paramount because they build their identity around something but it's still fragile because they know deep down that they probably could use work on it they just don't necessarily need you to draw a highlighter over that now the problem is you you can't necessarily tell who those people are going to be so you might say hey Jordan have you heard this show The Art of Charm and I might go no I haven't but I'll check it out wow this is decent I'll listen to this right even if I do say so myself or I might say thanks but I really don't need this and I'm mildly insulted that you would do that But I'll forget about that pretty soon and probably not hold it against you. So what I would say is don't worry about it. Recommend it to as many people as you think need it. But at the same time, 
there's going to be a certain number of people, the more insecure they are, the more this will happen. And insecure people are much more likely to reject this, which is something that we've said in the past on this show, which is the people that need this stuff the most are generally the people that reject it the hardest. Um, I've had many, uh, many occasions I've had conversations with groups of people that say, oh, my gosh, our friend needs this thing that you have, the, the boot camp you run in L.A., my friend really needs this, or my son really needs this, or my husband really needs this, and then when they finally broach a subject with that person, not only if it's, I've had this happen when I'm there, they'll say something like, that's so stupid. I can't believe people pay you for that. That's so ridiculous. What kind of losers go to your class? And I'm thinking, I just had a class full of U.S. Army Special Forces, but I'm sure you're really awesome, unemployed guy who's been, you know, 90 days without a job or nine years without a job and has been single the entire time and kind of smells bad. And these people all pity him. But yeah, no, you're really great. Keep maintaining that fiction. Um, that you don't need any help in this area. So there's going to be some people that unfortunately are just frankly not worth your time to help. If they're one of your loved ones, it might take a lot of persuasion. You might have to say, this show is funny or I really like this. It's good for other reasons. You should listen to it for reasons other than yourself. It's really interesting. It's good for learning, not, hey, your social skills are lacking in this area. You should check this out because that's not going to come across well to someone who is insecure. And unfortunately, those things go hand in hand. So it is tricky, but at the end of the day, most people are going to reject new things like this because it triggers their insecurity. And unless you're related to them or you really, really care about them, it's kind of time to just let it go. So I was hanging out with my parents in Australia. I brought them down to Australia. And one thing that I noticed that helped me and that I've, I've realized I've been doing subconsciously maybe for a while and that I would share with you all is, for example, I ordered breakfast. You know, whenever my parents are here, I don't know what it is. I order big breakfast when we go out. They always want to go out to breakfast. And instead of just drinking coffee, I'm like, I want the omelet with the chili. Da, da, da. So I had this big stack of toast that came with a bunch of eggs that I had ordered. And my mom started to make me feel guilty. She's like, oh, all that bread's going to go to waste. Are you going to leave that on the table? Oh, you didn't even touch it. And it, oh, why did they give you so much? Oh, you should maybe take it home. Like toasted bread. Like I'm going to take that home. <laughs> and I realized when something is bad for you, do you do this thing, Jason? You're a Midwestern kid. Do you feel guilty and then you kind of like you want to eat it then because you think it'll you'll feel less guilty. But then, of course, you also know you'll feel guilty after you eat it because it's just empty, disgusting, you know, buttered toast and you're already full. Does that happen to you? Not really. I think I've spent enough time in California to get away from that. But I can see a lot of people out here that's like, yeah, it's on the plate. I, I might as well eat it because, you know, that moon's over my hammy extra large. It's, it's already there and I, I paid for it. So I'm going to eat it. Yeah, so the question I started asking myself to alleviate that burden is I say, okay, do I want to trade some of my health for this? Because buttered toast, not good for you at all, especially when you're already full. Eating when you're already full, not good for you. Eating extra calories when you've already had a ton, not good for you. Do I want to trade some of my health to alleviate that feeling? And obviously nothing is worth your health, but the question, this question, asking yourself in the moment, helps evaluate whether you should force yourself to eat it. The answer is almost always no, right? Almost always, always, always no. You could take it to an extreme and be like, I'm never going to eat anything but bean sprouts, right? But usually you're going to have a little bit less willpower. You're going to breakfast. You've sort of made it a conscious decision to enjoy this. But at the end, you can look at your marginal return on eating that extra toast or eating those extra hash browns or that last pancake. And if you frame it as, am I willing to trade some of my health for this, then it becomes much, much less appealing. So that sort of mindset I wanted to share because I think a lot of people think about this subconsciously, but they don't really ask themselves, am I willing to trade some of my health? Because the answer to that is almost always like, are you insane? Of course not. You know, if you're drunk and you're outside a bar and someone's like, hey, do you want a cigarette? You might be like, sure. But if you say, am I willing to trade some of my health for this right now? It reframes the conversation entirely, in my opinion. All right. Little little aside there. What's next, Jason? Hey, guys. My best friend and I have known each other for roughly 15 years. We met in high school and were both 30 years old. When we first met, I suffered from bad anxiety and often depression. I had really no self-esteem or self-confidence. For lack of a better term, I was a loser. My friend, on the other hand, has always been the exact opposite. He's always had exuberant charm, confidence, and women have always flocked to him. Given these differences, our dynamic became a leader versus sidekick relationship that lasted throughout high school and into the beginning of college. 
I can't say I ever enjoyed this because I really value individuality and personal achievement. You might wonder why I put up with this in the first place. He lended me a warm shoulder to lean on. He invited me to become part of his family. He was willing to be my friend when others would not. However, as an adult, I've grown confident and become way more outgoing. I'm what you might call a late bloomer. The problem is that when we hang out together, his behavior towards me still seems to reflect this old dynamic. It hurts and it sucks. He still has intense charm when meeting people, which causes them to think that this dynamic still exists. I don't know if he knowingly does this or if it's just a series of old habits. Should I A. Simply cut him off and deal with the social ripple effects B. Try to explain this to him and hope he understands or C. Try to slowly set boundaries. Option A would be difficult because we share the same friends and his family has practically adopted me. I feel a bit stuck here like a hole has been dug for me all these years. What would you recommend? I'm sure you've seen this before and it's probably not that uncommon. Sincerely, the Blooming Socialite. Yeah, this is not that uncommon. And I have also gone through this with somebody where I used to be someone's sidekick friend. And we're not friends anymore for multiple reasons, actually. But it is something that his ego could not handle. There's there's a lot to this. A whole lot. Old patterns do break is the bottom line here. I can never see you as a sidekick. Now I'm going to have this mental image in my head of you in a Robin costume as mm. as the sidekick, which is something I probably never, ever wanted. But The little bulge there <laughs> on the green tights. I don't know what you were looking at, but hey, go yeah. for it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> don't front. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> the, the idea, though, old patterns do break. Old patterns do break. You can break through this type of thing. Now, I did not keep that particular friend because his ego could not handle it he kept trying to shove me back into that that bottle that that pigeonhole of like no i'm the cool one i'm the cool one i'm the person who gets all the girl i'm the person who all the people like i'm you know i'm the fr- funny one and it wasn't working for me and for a while i just couldn't hang it, it couldn't handle it because it was awful it felt really weird to be around him and like defer to him all the time so i started to make more and more of my own friends and he was like these people are stupid that guy's an idiot this guy and he would make up all these stories about these people because he was jealous and eventually i realized oh it's actually you that's insecure and you're trying to ruin these friendships if you really cared about me as a friend you wouldn't be doing that so that was sort of one of many nails in that particular coffin and this person still does this kind of stuff when we hang out it's still really you know they try to be the social leader but they do it in in ways that push other people down and i'm just not into that at all anymore surprise uh and what i would say is look hang out in larger groups where others will see you in a certain way uh which will help outframe his impression of you over time maybe so if you hang out in a bigger group of people and some of them are new, you don't have to play sidekick the whole time. The problem is if he's still there, that's still going to pull. That gravity is still going to pull on you. Now remember, he's used to a role that you have played in his life. And lo- likely, your sidekick mode holds up his self-esteem in some way. And I don't really get what hurts you here. You hint at his behavior being negative, but it's a little unclear. Like If he's being a total dick and belittling you because he sees you as less than, then you're not a sidekick. You're a whipping boy. You're in an abusive friendship. I know that sounds weird, but that's a real thing. And that's emotionally unhealthy for you. And sometimes you outgrow people. And yes, even family is part of this. I know people were like busting out their phone to write an email and ask about that. It probably won't come to that. But talking to him about this is not going to help. I guarantee you it's not going to help. Unless you're trying to just shine a light on something that he's doing that bothers you that's possible but most likely they're going to have no clue what you're talking about because it's really hard to read the label when you're inside the jar and this is something that he this is a pattern that he is in right now and this process will take some time if you can fix it it cannot be rushed but i would say starting asap you need a wider circle to reinforce your new positive self-image. If you stay with the same guy all the time, he's going to subconsciously or consciously try to force you back to where he thinks you belong on the social scale and in your personality. And that will cause friction inside your relationship. Take it from me, I went through this myself. And I don't envy you. This is possible, but you can't rush this. And in the meantime, you need other friends and you need to spend time with a bigger circle of people who don't necessarily know the old you as sidekick mode. And and my advantage, I moved a lot. I moved to a lot of different countries and a lot of different circles. I went to grad school. 
the advantage to moving so many times was that I could reinvent myself as much as I wanted to and that it was never really an issue. You don't have to move. I'm not saying that. But you do need to do something to change your environment, both socially and probably physically as well. So I would take classes. I would meet new people in other ways. I would go out alone. I know that's terrifying for a lot of you, but I would go out alone or with different groups of people and meet those whole circles. And I would get out of sidekick mode ASAP. Because if you try to have one foot in and one foot out, this process is going to take longer. So you kind of have to decide how much this friendship means to you. And I know right now you're like, this is one of my best friends. Oh, my God. But I have a feeling that once you start to blossom a little bit and come out of the cocoon, you might find, you might find, I'm not saying you will, you might find that this friend cares much more about you propping up their self-esteem and ego than they care about your growth and happiness. And that is going to change the context of your friendship. Trust me. Hey, if this is your first time listening, Fan Mail Friday is a great sample of how we operate, but it is by no means a full helping of all that AOC Podcast has to offer. Listener interaction is a great part of the show. We love answering this fan mail and giving advice, but our typical content is much more in-depth. We take well-known top performers in their field, work to unpack their methods, their theories, their insights. These are people you either know already or you should know, and we use that longer interview format to help you understand what processes or steps they used, which helped them become successful, and then we distill those concepts and help you apply them to your life. For a great place to start, check out some of our most popular episodes at theartofcharm.com. That's where you can find the best of, as well as our fundamentals toolbox, which includes what we like to call the basics of mixed mental arts, including topics such as reading body language, nonverbal communication, the science of attraction, negotiation techniques, networking and influence strategies, persuasion tactics, and everything else that we teach here at The Art of Charm and in our live residential boot camps. We'll send all of this to your inbox. Just go to theartofcharm.com slash challenge. And if you want to learn more about our in-person training, go to theartofcharm.com slash boot camp. Thanks for listening and supporting the podcast. For a list of all of our amazing sponsors and discounts, visit theartofcharm.com slash advertisers. Now, back to Fan Mail Friday. I know, Jason, we got some feedback on Corbin Payne's episode about dealing with law enforcement. You want to dive into that? Who boy, did we ever. I've been a long-term listener and fan of the show. Until today. I was extremely disappointed after listening to the latest episode of The Art of Charm, where you spoke with Corbin Payne. I am a police officer in Canada, not the United States. I've never been so insulted by a discussion about police as your discussion on this episode. Both of you continually said that you are supportive of law enforcement, yet you turned around and said police would trick you and they don't have your interest in mind. I've been a police officer for nine years. Prior to that, I was an EMT and a firefighter. The reason I became a police officer was to help people. I can speak for the majority of police. We do not want to trick people. Our desire is for justice. We don't target people for no reason. I was also disappointed in Corbin's story about an officer who made a false statement. I absolutely agree there are officers who should not be wearing the badge. But for 99% of police officers, we hate officers who lie. Because it calls into question the integrity of all of us. This isn't the Old West ways of policing where we cover up each other's mistakes. We are here to do an honorable job with the utmost integrity. And for Corbin to imply otherwise is insulting. I can tell you stories of lawyers who have met my wife and tried to intimidate me through her. They have tried to drag my personal life into courtrooms. If Corbin wants to talk about deception, lack of integrity, and dishonesty, maybe we can talk about lawyers who know of horrific crimes occurring and say nothing. I understand what the purpose of this episode was, and I absolutely agree that honest, decent people need not fear the police and should make sure their rights are protected but let's not paint all police with the same brush. I respect the work AOC does, and I hope this is just a one-off, but please know how extremely offensive this episode was to those who entered a profession with noble intentions. Signed, Unamused LEO. Hey, yeah, I want to respond a little bit to this. I I wrote this guy back right away, so I'm not angry about this at all. We actually straightened this out. He's a big fan of AOC. I think there may be a difference here, now that you're reading this and I'm rereading this again, in Canada versus the U.S., I know a lot of police and they're the first ones who will admit that they their job is to get certain things out of you and they're happily going to trick you. I don't know. I don't even think that's like a secret at all. And one of the first things we learned in law school was that the police are supposed to use lots of different techniques to get justice. And if some of that is deception in a way that's constitutional, then it's actually good for 
it's good. It's how they get their job done. So this isn't something about, you know, officers shouldn't do this, they shouldn't lie, da 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 yeah, you hate officers who lie, but at some point you might be doing that in order to get what you think is the truth out of a suspect. That's how that works. Lawyers are also I, I look, there's bad lawyers, there's bad cops. I don't like the what aboutism that's in this letter. What about lawyers? Well, frankly, if we want to go down that road, yes, there's a lot of crappy lawyers. They're actually kind of famous for that. However, a lawyer's job is to zealously advocate for their client. So they're actually supposed to know about horrific crimes and come up with a way to defend that person anyway. That's actually their job. So there's a big difference here. So I disagree with some of this. And uh, like I said, I think that we felt really bad because we were really trying to be fair to law enforcement in this episode. We actually got another piece, which I think illustrates our point a little bit better, also from a police officer. Jason, take it away. Hello and happy Thanksgiving. I felt compelled to write after hearing episode 671 with Corbin Payne. I wanted to let you know what my takeaway from the show was. I was listening to Corbin Payne while driving for work. I've been in law enforcement for 13 years and was actually listening while driving at work. At first, when I read the show notes, I figured I'd make it five minutes in and have to stop. To my surprise, I found the show to be very thought out and educational. It would have been very easy for you or Mr. Payne to go down a disrespectful mainstream media or politically correct road given the topics at hand. This was clearly not the case, and I commend you as well as Mr. Payne for talking about a hot-button topic and maintaining a professional dialogue about law enforcement encounters. In short, you and Mr. Payne delivered content that I felt comfortable sharing with my family and friends about the legal process, due largely in part by the high level of respect that was maintained when discussing police activities. Furthermore, I agree with the vast majority of information and recommendations Mr. Payne offered. Yes, there are bad police as well as incompetent ones, but the easy road of all police are bad and trying to kill or send you to prison was avoided, which I appreciated the most. I've been listening to all your offerings for about a year, and a single podcast I didn't agree with wouldn't have turned me off from following you. However, the way you presented the episode made me a bigger fan. Just wanted to say thank you, and I wish you continued success in your career and offerings. Respectfully, Conscientious Cop. So this is funny because we got this like the same day. And what I the reason I wanted to share it was because I think a lot of people, especially in law enforcement, were maybe sharing this type of perspective. And people who are not in law enforcement, for that matter, maybe shared this perspective about that particular episode. And also, I think it's very illustrative because we have a lot of people on the show, listening to the show, who create, who are freelancers, artists, creators, creatives of some kind. And... This goes to show that you really have no idea. You're going to please some people and you're not going to please others. We all know that. But you can find two people in the same industry, in the same demographic, you know, males of of this age group in this geographic area, and they can differ greatly on their opinion of your work, even though it's presented in the exact same way. So this for me was kind of funny because it was such juxtaposition because it was such juxtaposition and it was literally within the same 12 hour span that we were looking at these emails and these feedback pieces on this particular episode. So if you're getting mixed feedback about something, look, we all get it. And it's funny because you can just see how two people see things in totally different ways. All right. But documentary of the week, Jason, you watch something. What do you got? I watched Obey Giant, the Shepherd Fairy documentary on Hulu. It's a Hulu exclusive. So if you don't have Hulu, you might have to wait a little bit to see it. But I'm a huge Shepherd Fairy fan. And if you guys don't know who Shepherd Fairy is, uh, have you seen the that little poster uh, about Obama with the hope underneath, the Obama hope poster? Yeah, sure. Yeah, Shepard did that, but he also did what's called Obey Giant, which is the name of the, the piece, but also those Andre the Giant, uh, they're, they're very minimalistic drawings and graffiti and stickers. I'm sure you've seen them. Yeah, okay, so this this is the brand Obey with all these different sort of like hand-drawn print type of art right shepherd fairy is the guy behind that he's uh he's, oh. a, he's a graffiti artist and a very famous graffiti artist but he like i said he also did the the hope poster for obama and there was a lot of controversy around the hope poster and but this this documentary just takes us through his his upbringing how he got to where he is which was a fascinating story and also discusses the lawsuit over the hope poster and how he screwed up and he admits he screwed up by taking another artist's photography and not paying for it and then lying about it and eventually coming to fix it. But it's a, it's a great story, and I'm a huge Shepard Fairey fan. I, I met him a long time ago, 
and have been to his gallery many times. So I'm a little biased, but I really love his work, and I have some in my house. Right on. It's a great documentary, and I highly recommend everybody check it out. It also, that sounds like the Banksy documentary. Did you ever see Exit Through the Gift Shop about Banksy? Yes, and Shepard was in that documentary quite a bit. They showed some of his gorilla paintings uh, back in the day. So it sounds like we kind of have two, Exit Through the Gift Shop and Obey Giant. So if you can't get Obey Giant because you don't have Hulu, you can watch Exit Through the Gift Shop and you can watch Banksy. Uh, And these are like viral street artists. Banksy is well known. And if you haven't heard of him, you'll still probably be quite interested in this because it is interesting, his story and all the stuff he did. And when I was in Cuba, me and Jenny just went for a walk uh, through a neighborhood, just Mm -hmm. went through a neighborhood and we spotted a definite Banksy piece. Wow. And took photos. And we took photos, and there were only a couple people online that were like, hey, is this Banksy? Because we saw this from our tour bus in Cuba. And I thought, wow, we were just randomly walking around, and we saw this garage painted almost certainly by him. I mean, it looked so, so much like that. Either that or it was an awesome forgery randomly in a neighborhood <laughs> in Cuba. Awesome. No, yeah. Banksy's, Banksy's great. All right. Hope you all enjoyed that. Don't forget, you can email us at Friday at the art of charm dot com to get your questions answered on the air. Keep everyone anonymous. so You can either make up your own funny name or we can do it. If it's feedback for us or the show, we're fans of strong opinions loosely held and we'd love to argue like we're right and listen like we're wrong. So don't be shy to hit us up over here. A link to the show notes for this episode can be found at theartofcharm.com slash FMF143. Quick shout-outs to Jen Kerr and Matt Knight. We played an escape game down under in Australia. Joanne Alilovich, Leanne Hughes, and her coworker Sean Lavin, also fans of the show that I met up and hung out, had a beer with, and Loretta Crete, who I met at a conference, also in Australia, a fellow lawyer. Really cool meeting a lot of AOC fans down in Australia. I know there were a lot of people that I could not meet up with, but I'll be back there. I love Australia. Really fun place. New Zealand, I know a lot of people reached out. I was only there for a little bit and I was in the middle of nowhere on like sheep farms hanging out with my parents. So I'll be back. Trust me on that. Are you in a strange land listening to our familiar voices? If so, hit me up. We'd love to shout you out here on the show and we'd love to hear from you either way. I'm on Twitter at The Art of Charm. It's a great way to engage with the show. And JD, you're on uh, social medias. I'm on the Twitter at the JP Def and the Instagram at JPD. And check out my news podcast, Grumpy Old Geeks, every Monday. Go to GOG.show slash iTunes to subscribe. All right, right on. I'm also on Instagram at Jordan Harbinger. So Twitter at The Art of Charm, Instagram at Jordan Harbinger. And don't forget about the Art of Charm Challenge. Go to theartofcharm.com slash challenge to take part. We take you step by step at making connections, becoming a better networker, increasing your social capital, your charisma, the network that you create around your personal and work stuff. And it's for both guys and gals. It's free. It's all about moving forward. And that's at theartofcharm.com slash challenge. There's also more from AOC at The Art of Charm dot com including info on our live residential boot camps that we run every single week in LA with AJ and Johnny. If you really want to dig into this stuff and work on your AOC skills with AJ and Johnny as your coaches, that's all at the art of charm.com slash boot camp. Now stay charming, get out there and connect and leave everyone better than you found them. Hey it's Jay Moore and it is time finally for America's Lakers podcast. That's right, I'm going to be hosting America's Lakers podcast. My man Aaron Larsoul, an analytical genius, he's going to bring to the table what I can't every Wednesday. America's Lakers podcast exclusively at podcast1.com, the podcast1.com app which I highly recommend. You can rate and review this podcast on all Apple products. And guess what we're not going to do? We're not going to bathe in the gossip and the gratuitous negativity that's been swallowing Los Angeles whole lately. Who did what? Who snitched? Who said what? How about truth? How about facts? How about statistics? How about rotations? What's Luke Walton thinking? Who's underperforming? Who's overachieving? Who's rewarded? Who's coming? Who's going? And what are we going to do with all that delightful, delicious cap space? America's Lakers podcast with me, Jay Moore, and my man, my brother, Aaron Larsoul, every Wednesday, podcast1.com.